Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig Dale, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal and my guest this week is Mark Burgar who coaches in Agile and other workplace improvements. Hello Mark, how are you? Hi Craig, I'm doing fine, how are you? Yeah, it's good to have you on the show. I know you've been a regular listener for some time so it's uh, good to pull you into the, the uh-huh. virtual studio. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So we're going to be talking this week about really one of the big changes that has happened over the last couple of years spurred on by the pandemic and um, so many of us um, have had the, the just the way we work radically overhauled now not everybody um, a lot of people have found themselves now working from home or, or changing their work arrangements we know that not every job can be worked from home we know that not every house not every home is suitable to be worked from and those two topics are, are possibly for another podcast there there are uh, interest areas of mine that I'd like to come back to but for those of us who have been privileged enough to to be to work those jobs that can be worked from home and have those environments that we can work from we have seen this massive overhaul in the way we work something that's been promised for decades uh, the, the technology has been promised since probably at least the 1960s, if not before. We saw things like films like 2001 A Space Odyssey having uh, video calls from the moon. We've seen the cyberpunk worlds of the 1980s where everybody worked in these uh, virtual cubicles from massive mega corporations. So the technology has at least been envisaged since then, but it never really kind of came into the real world until the pandemic hit. Mark, why has it taken so long? Was it a, a technological issue that just happened to arrive at a time when we needed it? Or did it take something like the pandemic to spur that cultural shift? So I would actually argue that it has happened way before the pandemic. So in IT, we know of several companies that actually made a move to remote working uh, long before the pandemic. So my first remote experience was actually at the dawn of the internet uh, when I still was doing internet application programming, I worked for a company in Canada and basically wrote internet code for them um, where they had customers there and did the customer interaction. So um, has been around for a long time. There has even been books. Um, a company called 37 Signals um, switched to remote working, wrote a book, came out several years before the pandemic where they documented their experience. Um, I know a few people in the UK, um, uh, IT people might know Cucumber as a tool, so the company behind that, they have uh, done complete remote working. So the technology has certainly been around long enough for people to do it way before the pandemic, and some people have had that experience. But as you said, for the vast majority of people, the pandemic was their first experience. Um, And we also see now already as the as we start to learn how to live with the virus, I do not want to say the pandemic is over, because for me it's far from, but um, people are also quite eager to revert back to um, old, old ways of working. Um, so the core reason why it didn't take off before um, is cultural. So to, to some extent, so we have to understand work as a social um, endeavor, primarily, um, Work is a social activity. And a lot of the cultural issues why organizations, for example, have not embraced remote work before is that they were concerned about what kind of level of control um, they have over people. So if, if you're a manager, um, you want to you want to see your people, you want to see that they're busy, you want to be able to go to their desk and see that they're doing the right thing. And all of these kind of things that we got very used to that were almost r- ritually entrenched in our ways of working, they got disrupted in the pandemic. Suddenly, everybody had to learn to do things differently. But so going back to your question, I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah. And did, did, did we see some of that? desire to keep an eye on people kind of filter into the, the homework environment as well and is, is that does that feel different I, I can imagine myself feeling a bit different about a manager glancing out of their office window and watching me work work at my desk compared to for example a manager checking up their key logger that they have installed on my computer to make sure I'm constantly typing yes yeah, so um I'm working currently most of the time um, with an organization called Register of Scotland, and I have to say they did an excellent job. Um, 
but it even emerged in that environment. So I would say largely they trust their people and they believe in their people. Um, but even at that level, you saw some activity occasionally and say, okay, can we check logs? Uh, when were they on the VPN, et cetera, things like that, because there were some concerns about people taking advantage. But what we've read in the industry and what we've seen in some companies is that what we call surveillance software massively took off during the pandemic. So organizations would literally uh, install software that would detect that your face is on the camera, even when you're not in a meeting, as in you had you had the camera on all day, uh, nine to five, and it would detect when you leave the field of vision of the camera. So they could say how long were you at your computer. And so the surveillance IT uh, intrusion um, it is a massive issue. Um, it also shows how little trust these people have in their employees, uh, which is also a big issue because um, quite frankly, I wouldn't work for such an organization. So if you don't trust me that I have um, the intent and the motivation to do a good job, why would you hire me? So I would even you know, question what, what is my relationship with you? But these things have happened and um, there is a danger that uh, remote working as such if, if these surveillance technologies are tolerated, actually will lead to a normalization of being surveilled. surveilled. So this is a worry for me. So the industry in general seems to have reacted, so workers especially, quite uh, strongly um, against these technologies, but that always, always means you have to have choice, as in you can choose to go working elsewhere. And a lot of people do not have the choice, as in um, they're, they're locked in, as in they don't have... There are many jobs for them available. If they're available, often the same conditions will apply, et cetera. So there is a danger that remote work can lead to a higher level of surveillance. Now, you mentioned there that a lot of uh, companies were already pioneers in this, this area of remote working. But what about, in your experience, the, the other companies for, for whom the pandemic was a sudden shock? How, did, how quickly were they able to adapt and how easy was it for them to, to adapt to, to remote working? So again, I think there is a scale. Um, so it depends a little bit on, on the company itself. So for example, I spent a few years working for a bank, large, one of the top five banks in the UK, which are site, uh, sites around the country. And so even if people uh, rarely worked from home, you had teleconferencing already as your standard means of operating. Um, so they had equipment with meeting rooms, etc. So given that that was already something they were used to, switching to remote was probably less painful as an organization um, that everybody had. So one building, everybody in the same site, so had none of this technology um, on site installed, any experience with it, etc. Um, so we also heard then and read um, from companies that um, didn't have any of, these, any of this kind of experience that it took them obviously longer to get into some sort of uh, new routines and, and new methods of, of working and, and getting back to productivity. But overwhelmingly, I think people have coped very well with that. So there was a um, worry at the beginning of the pandemic that productivity um, will drop and as far as we can tell in knowledge work, that was not very noticeable with maybe the first few weeks as an exception. Yeah, I can certainly um, speak to my own experiences of, I had quite a lot of experience of working remotely or at least working on my own, even back to university when I was doing my PhD, I was often, even while that was lab based, I was often literally the only person in the lab, so I didn't need a lot of people around me. And actually when I started at Commonweal, I worked the first year from home. Uh, before I went, um, before I started coming into the office with the rest of the team, um, so it was something that I personally slid into relatively easily. We have had various challenges and hurdles within the team that we've overcome over the last couple of years. I definitely don't miss the commute to work, which has been a major plus for me. <laughs> um, on Did the other you? hand, on the other hand, I do do recognise that those two hours a day that I'm not commuting it's very easy to simply work them so I end up working longer hours than I did when I was commuting and um, so I wonder how much of the extra productivity has come from just people overworking so uh, of Scotland we so we have the benefit that 
we had a fair cohort of people who actually were familiar with the problems that this might bring. So there's a number of agile coaches, so a good number of agile coaches, but there were also people within, let's say, HR who had some empathy for these kind of things and generally quite a few of the managers and workers through all the departments. So this was highlighted very early on. Yeah, so we even encouraged people. So if you would do long meetings that we do breaks and literally tell people, get off uh, your chair, go walk around, go make a coffee. Um, where this was not addressed, I can easily imagine that, yes, as you said, people would add that to their workday. So in, in, a, in the environment that I was before, in that bank, um, I talked to some of the people during early early months of the pandemic, and that was exactly what was happening. So they were already working long hours anyway because of the stressful environment, the high pressure, etc. And then, yes, the the time they lost to uh, no longer having to commute or the gains um, just meant, yeah, okay. So I get up the same time that I usually do, and I'm just at my computer earlier on. I start checking my email an hour earlier, and I will check my email two hours later than. So this has certainly happened, but again, this comes down to does the organization have a sensitivity for that? So Register of Scotland was very good. Um, HR would very quickly send out emails, literally telling people, do not do this. Uh, make sure that, so we talked about sustainability. We um, put well-being front and center, etc. So people were aware that this might be a trap to fall into and were encouraged to avoid it, but equally, um, as I said, coaches, managers, team leads, etc., would would be encouraging their team, etc., all the time. Go take breaks, but yeah, it needs to be done proactively. And yeah. so this is a lot. How well did you cope with the change? Was how much effort did the organization actually put into supporting their workers coping with the change, and how um, willing were they to pay attention to all the things that might take place that they wouldn't see and wouldn't experience unless they really asked the question. So looking a bit forward now, as we come out of the pandemic over the next, however long it takes us to get out of the pandemic, because um, I, I, that's that's still quite an uncertain thing at the moment. Um, what does the future hold? Will we all go back to the office? So the general expectation is that um, some jobs will stay entirely remote. So. A, Especially in the programming world, you can see people uh, that were forced back into the office, quitting the company and finding jobs where they were allowed to, uh, to stay remote. Um, but also because this is an experience um, we had in knowledge work for a long time, there is a need for face-to-face. -face. So Agile has had the mantra from the beginning of co-locating interdisciplinary teams. So you would put not just programmers together, but also testers, business analysts, designers, people interfacing with customers, um, user research, user experience, product, etc to have daily face-to-face -face interactions to share the, share the work proactively. Um, there are even theories around cognition, et cetera, that say um, we need to be in the presence of others. So I believe the future will be a hybrid and we can see many organizations already discussing, so how are we gonna do it? Um, what you'll read a lot is people are looking for a one size fits all model, something like, so what is best, three days in a week in the office, two days at home or vice versa. Um, given my experience with um, improving work situations, my suggestion would be for even at, not even an organization of a policy, but literally do this at team level and maybe even in the context of what are you currently working on. So let's say, for example, you're a product team. If you are at the beginning of your discovery phase for a new product or a big change in your service or so, probably more face-to-face -face time will be beneficial. Once you switch over in delivery mode, where it's literally now we're going to implement all the stuff that we discovered, etc., cetera, you, you might want to switch to a more remote mode. Um, so... I, that would be my suggestion or my recommendation. Do not try a one size fits all. Do not try to enforce certain things with policy, but give teams and, and your workers the liberty to actually decide in their context what works for you best. Um, because equally people have said that throughout the pandemic, all the quality of life that they gain from having more freedom by working from home, having a bit more control over their time, um, not having to eat 
cheapo, um, you know, bought lunch from Pret-a-Porter or something, um, Pret-a-Manger, sorry, or any other um, outlets that may exist. Um, and instead of being able to, you know, do your fresh salad at home or make a fresh soup or something. So these qualities need to be appreciated. But face-to-face -face time will still be needed, especially when um, the sharing of the knowledge is at an intense level. Yeah, so hybrid, yeah. hybrid will be probably the norm. Yeah, no, I certainly, I certainly have spoken to people, especially folk who, um, who, who don't have a home environment where it's been easy to adjust to to, to work, who have been keen to get back into the office um, uh, more than more than, more than some others who, like myself, really despise that morning commute. Uh, so it might, it could be a team level, could even be flexible around individual workers, I guess. Yeah. So registers, for example, will do exactly that. So there's some work that actually needs that registers does that needs needs you to be physically at the building because it's like you you scan paper deeds etc. And so so there's a lot of labor that actually can't be done from home. We have to accommodate that. But then the other side is individuals who don't have a good environment. Then you will need to give them a desk. Now in the short term given that most organizations have a lot of office space. So traditional, I don't think that's going to be a problem. But from a cost model, what we already see emerging is um, that you might actually just go and rent a desk as part of your, so this is part of what the company pays you for or, or pays for you in something like uh, WeWork or so these rented office or rented space arrangements because it might become cheaper for companies to do it that way than to have their own you know, series of hot desks and never knowing how many people are actually going to use them and not use them on a longer term. That was actually a model we we floated as an idea in the, the Commonweal uh, Green New Deal plan, our common home, uh, as we were looking for ways to, uh, ways to really, it was really focused on reducing that commute, to, to reduce the amount of tra traffic on the road. One, one way could have been to have these hot desks or, t or small flexible offices located within walking distance of, of, of communities. We wrote that before the pandemic as well. Um, so, so what are the, what are some of the opportunities and lessons we've learned from this, this crisis period? And uh, as we come, as people do start going back to the office and what are the technological or the cultural gaps that still really remain to be, uh, to be overcome? Okay, so let's start quickly with the technological gaps, just because they're not obvious. Um, so once you're in a hybrid environment, um, one of the difficulties that you have is, so you have some people who are in the office and some people are at home. Um, so pre-pandemic, um, we actually had a mantra, so as facilitators, coaches, um, that said, if, if one person is remote, everybody has to be remote to, to make a meeting happen. Their remote means they work from a different building, from a different location, um, et cetera, more than they would be working from home, but everything equally applied. So what we meant with that was, um, if you have, like say, six people in a room around a table and they have a big screen with one camera, and then you have like one or two people who are at home, just by the nature of how things currently work, they would have difficulties to connect. Yeah, they would, yeah. you would have an experience of, yeah, I'm not really there. I'm not really part. Um, you would not be really invited as much into con contributing because um, your face is just not the same as somebody who's in the room, etc. cetera. Um, so then the solution was everybody has to have a laptop or at least desktop computer with a camera and everybody would, essentially interact in the same on, on a same level playing field um, that is not ideal yeah because you then lose a lot of the opportunities from having a few people who are in the same location and having some of the enhanced cognitive abilities of a, of a team being together so what we see now technologists are researching is like so how can we use let's say 360 degree cameras so that even if you're not in the room, you, you can sort of see everybody who is in the room equally well. So you will see who's speaking, uh, omnidirectional microphone problems so that you even maybe from a stereo um, headphones, you could tell, oh, this must be the person over there who's talking now, that must be the other person. Um, they're, they're experimenting with um, 
your your technology technological avatar standing is a remote presence it's called um it's basically like a little robot that has a screen with your face on it but in the room can in, so can participate physically in a physical space so to speak on your behalf so some of these problems still have to be solved yeah so it's not perfect yet hybrid um it's far from perfect because we haven't had a need. There wasn't enough demand, and I expect the demand will now um, be sufficient that these technologies will be developed. So there's a gap that needs to be addressed and needs to be understood when you move to a hybrid environment that you uh, need to cater for it. Again, having coaches or uh, so agile coaches often see themselves also just as workplace facilitators, having facilitators who understand these things and can um, facilitate a team that is working in a hybrid manner will probably be a very good um, compensation for now until the technology catches up. But there are huge opportunities. Um, so an obvious one is people with disabilities for which travel is really inhibited of participating yes. in work. Um, if they don't have to travel to participate, then suddenly you can you can employ them, you can give them access, you can enable them in ways that was difficult before or um, came with a high cost. So I worked at the NHS for a while um, and um, they enabled a person um, who was completely disabled, so motorized chair and everything, um, to be able to work in the office at great cost, but even that was never perfect for that person because they might one day have some physical reason why they can't come to the office and needed care. They would have been able to participate from a cognitive ability, but just the, the physical disability uh, created a blocker. Um, so for a lot of these people, being able to work from home will be of great benefit. Another opportunity is diversity. So right now, because, or pre-pandemic, because we have this dogma of you have to come into an office, you could only employ people who were geographically close enough to do that. Um, especially knowledge work benefits from having uh, a lot of cultural diversity in your team. People with different life experiences will, um, for example, if you design services or product, will bring perspectives that will make your products and services better. So suddenly you have the ability to actually employ people from far away. Um, so there's a big opportunity in that, that I believe a lot of, especially product service company, but maybe even government co uh, organizations will, will be able to benefit from. Yeah. Um, one of the very few things I think the Star Wars prequel movies got right was that image of the Jedi Council with about half of the Jedi is physically present in the room and the other half coming in via hologram. Um, but we're probably still a wee ways away from that. Um, now, another thing that you've, you mentioned that you really wanted to talk about is something that I've got quite excited about is the concept introduced by the economist, the late great economist David Graeber, the concept of the bullshit job. This was one of the, 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 the books he published not long before he, he, he died. Um, but I think it's something that is probably required reading for anyone who is interested in anything to do with work, workers' rights, working conditions, whatever. Um, we can't have David on the show, but Mark, you're the next best thing. Yeah. What is a bullshit job? So, um, I think the motivation for him for the book was to start to talk about some of the really broad and widely observable dysfunctions that we have as we move to a knowledge work economy. Um, so, one one of the issues that have has driven this. Uh, move to a knowledge work economy is that we we got a lot more efficient in in producing our foods and goods and etc and that needs less and less labor so um people start to do other things and and what better to do than actually using their mental capabilities to uh, improve our society and make our lives better um but as we have done this um what you observed is essentially a lot of um misbehavior you could say have started creeping into the working world and so um he, he called he calls these things out in this this book called bullshit job so the first thing I, I really want people to take away is david graber says the criteria for a bullshit job is that the person who is doing the job 
can say, I'm not adding any value. So we should never call somebody else's job a bullshit job because so we're then in shaming, blaming territory and that will not help anyone. Also, um, we might just not see where the value is in somebody else's job because we're not experiencing the job through their eyes and their um, um, daily practices. So it's not a bullshit job unless the person who is doing the job says so. But he is then calling out several um, types of, of behavior that he's noticed and as, as, a, as a workplace coach, I, I can see I've seen all of them. Um, he, he calls them types as in the, the way he describes them in the book, there are people who are this, um, the way I would maybe frame it is, many people can see doing some of this because I don't believe there are these types, but so some of, some example of the type. So for example, called something a flunky is somebody who's constantly um, doing things to look good to his superiors. Yeah, so it's basically playing up. Um, yeah. There's some nest listing uh, words we could use for that. Um, but to a certain extent, we all do that at some point in time. Yeah, so we do want to uh, be seen as as valuable by our superiors because we believe that will matter whether we're going to keep our job or get a promotion or get a pay increase or maybe just get nicer things to do. Um, it becomes a dysfunction when somebody really spends a lot of their energy on that, and I think almost everybody will have experienced that somewhere somehow in in work. So equally, there are the opposite. There are goons. They're, these are people who want to try keep everybody on their level or lower, um, keep them down. Yeah. So constantly uh, criticizing them, devaluing the work that other people are doing. Um, there's a category he calls duct tapers. Um, these are people who can fix things, but they're deliberately. Um, sometimes also unintentionally, never actually do a permanent fix so that they're constantly needed. So um, I experienced this, for example, uh, in, a, in a knowledge work environment where somebody literally told me um, he will not explain things to me because that's his job security. So as soon as he would explain the things that he's really an expert in, his job security is gone. And a lot of people um, in, in a volatile environment um, where where people are constantly under pressure are actually almost encouraged to become duct tapers and only ever apply temporary fixes and never allow a problem to be really solved. Yeah, I, I've certainly um, even seen that at an organisational level where faced with a problem and you can either put a, a duct tape solution that costs £100 but will break next year or spend £1,000 for a permanent fix yeah. The people who who can approve the, the the spending always pick the cheaper option, and they rather IT, spend a hundred pounds every single time. I mean, equally, so in IT, you also see almost the inverse of that, um, where organisations um, literally have an IT setup that breaks every day, and need manual uh, labour to intervene and fix it all the time. And the people who are doing the fixes are actually tired of doing them. They tell the organisation, "Here's how you could permanently fix it." But because it would require a little bit of investment, the organization never does it. So uh, in operations, for example, we have this term of toil and people are literally complaining about, hey, I didn't become uh, an IT worker to do toil. Yeah, but the organization by its dysfunction almost um, forces them to, to do that all day. So um, there's always a, a, an opposite side when we see some of these dysfunctions. So probably the, the, the strongest um, crit uh, critique that he has lobbied at is at management. Yeah, so uh, what we've seen in a lot of organization is what I call the bloating of middle management. So middle management has, has a bad rep, but that is because it has been abused. There is a need for middle management. So um, there's lots of organizational fear that will explain this, but roughly you need to have an exec that looks uh, maybe two, three years into the future and tries to set a strategic uh, direction. And you need the, the cold face where people actually producing what is of value. But you need some layer in the middle that connects the two. Yeah, so middle management has a function. But what we're seeing is um, often organizations where this is bloated up to like 10 tiers of middle management. Often the people who are in there, they're so what David Graeber calls box, tick, box tickers, tickers. They just create work for themselves and maybe other managers, long checklists of things that need to happen just to 
um, connect the top to the bottom of the organization, that if you actually look for it from a value perspective, uh, is it as adding anything of real value to the people who buy the product or the services of this company or the goods of this company, you, you can't find value, yeah? So he calls that box tickers, but they exist. And uh, another side is task masters, so the people who are actually not doing anything themselves, but actually just find all these things that they can control. So instead of trusting their employees, for example, to do a good job, so what we call intent-based leadership, tell them um, what they need to achieve and maybe ask them how, how they need help to do that. They actually will uh, want to know exactly from everybody, what are you going to do, put this in a complex plan, and then constantly track that everything happens according to the plan, which also in knowledge works is nonsense, because at the outset of your plan, you have an Im you imagine how you're going to do the work, but as you do the work, you're constantly discovering things that you actually didn't think about when you did the plan. So actually competent knowledge workers constantly improvise to adapt the plan. Now, if you have a taskmaster who just sits there and says, hey, here's my chart and you haven't done this thing and this thing and this thing, you're just overloading your knowledge workers who still try to actually realize your value to also cater to your managerial needs um, of following the plan. Yeah, and of course, no plan survives contact in, with the with the enemy intact. So exactly. if you're not able to change the plan because of changed circumstances, then where do you go from there? Exactly. So what Graeber Wheel was talking about is that looking at how we're changing the economic life, how we're doing knowledge work, etc. We're actually not doing a very good job. Yeah, this we're not doing this in a very effective manner, and largely this is uh, by social pressure. It's because we're not um, we're not really focusing on the value that we're trying to achieve in producing the work, but because we have to cater to so many social needs that are um, influencing in the organization. So what you often see is managers intuitively believe that they're going to produce the most value for the organization if they keep everybody busy. So we call this utilization. Um, this comes from a so utilization thinking makes perfect sense in a mechanical world, yeah? Um, if, if you think it, you, you have a machine or so, yeah? So you get value when the machine is utilized well, yeah? Um, if the machine just stands around, obviously we shouldn't have bought it or we should have sold it maybe after it was needed, etc. cetera. Um, so utilization comes from that thinking, from old manufacturing thinking. But even in manufacturing, they discovered already in the 60s and 70s that because now manufacturing became a chain of events, that the utilization of a single machine is actually not very interesting. So they started to think about flow. So yeah. you're producing, so let's say you're producing a car. Yeah? So Toyota, for example, is very famous because they started to switch them their thinking of an optimization model to actually how, how many cars do we actually complete, yeah? And what do we need to complete more cars and taking the focus off a single worker's utilization? They're, they were no longer interested in that. Equally in knowledge work, we should stop being worried about everybody being busy, but um, being focused that we're achieving the outcomes for our customers, um, for services, etc. Uh, for citizens if you're a government organization and so the utilization thing uh, so as long as we're clinging to utilization thinking then people will start falling into all of these uh, bullshit behaviors yeah they will do things that don't add value and then hence will create jobs and will create work that people themselves don't experience that adding value yeah and it really does turn tries to turn people into that neoliberal um, model that, that reduces people to just an efficient economic unit. And as you say, that you, how do you get as much utilization out of that economic unit as you possibly can? And you're no longer treating, you're no longer dealing with a worker at that point. You're, you're dealing with a line on a spreadsheet that you're trying to maximize. Yes. And knowledge work now largely requires teams, not a worker. So, in, obviously teams consist of workers, but in order to achieve your outcomes, you need to facilitate a team of several people, sometimes as few as two or three, but often 15 or 25 or 150, and you need to coordinate them. And so long, if you then still have your focus on everybody being busy, you just lose sight of actually what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. As also, this creates a lot of turbulence by 
because people then suddenly are busy or let's say you give them individual uh, targets to achieve, um, they will be motivated to achieve these targets, but these targets will then suddenly interfere with the flow of the value piece that you're actually trying to accelerate through your organization. So these two will uh, get in direct conflict of each other. And so by that, you actually, again, um, provoking a lot of things that when you look from the outside in, look as people behaving badly. At the start of the the, the, the program, you mentioned the, the, you had an interest in the philosophies of Maslow and you were trying to apply that to uh, to, to workplaces. How does that kind of thinking, um, well, how does it apply to the workplace as a whole and how does that rearrange that relationship between workers, work and workplaces and, and how people are treated as they do their job? So um, Maslow, um, who's famous for a pyramid, which he never actually created. The pyramid comes from a management consultant who just tried to sell something. Um, so he, he has talked about needs, but in a more complex way than the pyramid. Um, but in one of his endeavors, he actually started looking at, he was asked to help uh, a modern organization at the time uh, with some management problems. And they wanted him because he was a psychologist and thought, yeah, he might have some insights what we could do. Uh, so he wrote a book um, about management. And a core insight that he had was that he saw that um, the way they tried to optimize was either at the organization level or at the level of the worker. So either trying to do things that would make a, a worker more productive or then doing structural changes to organization. But the insight was there is a, so there is a two side dependency. So on one side, the worker requires a good organization to be productive, motivated, et cetera. But equally the, a good organization is competent um, workers so that they can uh, actually be productive as well and create value and be sustainable. So there is an interaction. So what he, his insight was that if you want to affect change and improve organizations, you have to act in a coordinated way at both levels. So equally, you have to, you have to first look at the whole as a system. So uh, system thinking or system theory or complexity theory play in here. You have to understand that an organization is a complex adaptive system. Yeah, like an organism, like an animal, like a human, um, like an environment. You have to treat it as a complex system. And if you want to intervene in the complex system, you have to understand that the system has multiple levels uh, at which it organizes itself. And in order to achieve change, you have to know, you have to intervene at several levels in a coordinated way to achieve actual sustainable change. So if you only go at one level, sooner or later, the system will revert back to what was stable before. Yeah. So unless you do that at multiple levels and in a coordinated way, you're unlikely actually do, going to achieve sustainable change. Um, so this was an insight I had from Maslow. He also then linked uh, the workplace to actually changing society that he said, so we can do experiments as how, how we're organizing a social systems uh, in a much quicker way. We can experiment with new ideas and models in a workplace much quicker than we can a uh, society. And he had this vision that uh, if we get work to become much more purposeful and fulfilling and more effective and efficient, then that would point out also how we could improve society as a whole uh, in a more holistic way. That is the, I guess, the challenge for workplaces as we do come out of the pandemic and, and beyond, because as you say, this, these are challenges that were apparent in the, the sector even before the pandemic came along and forced us to make those changes. Yeah, nothing um, was new, but it is an opportunity. <laughs> yes. So a lesson out there is for, for anyone listening who, who can see these opportunities, embrace them. Mark, thank you for coming on to the show. That has been a fascinating chat and um, I'm, I'm hoping some, some folk will take something away from this. Um, and I'll finish up, just as I always do, by reminding uh, our listeners that Commonweal as an organisation is entirely funded by folk like yourself, giving us regular donations of five pounds or ten pounds a month we don't get government money we don't have corporate sponsors we don't even have adverts on our website so we are entirely supported by folk like yourselves um, and i hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast please listen to it please share it around and please come back next week